All right. Okay, thank you, Cameron, and, and everyone else for being here. Um, this talk is going to be a little bit about the prototype situation, uh, where we started um, exploring these analogies uh, in a very concrete way to pull out signals. And this, this is the under effect uh, experiment. And what we can learn from that about other types of analog uh, space time effects that can be implemented in the lab and can potentially be connected to relativistic quantum information ideas. Uh, and so this is our beloved pancake. It's going to be representative of our favorite scenario where we have a relativistic 2 plus 1 uh, field, uh, either a pancake BEC or a thin film of superfluid or just a surface wave. Um, so as I mentioned, we have this prototype case uh, shooting lasers at a pancake and seeing if we could observe things like the under effect with it. And the implementation of an under DeWitt detector in those systems is going to be the most important thing that we could pull away from those, uh, from this prototype, because it could be used for a lot of different contexts. So I'm, I'm going to describe some features about this uh, setup and what we can take from that to apply to other RQI uh, implementations. Um, so to that effect, I'll talk a little bit about photon counting and photocurrents. Um, and then a couple of words about the photon flux and power spectral density. In this respect, there will be some key differences between the predictions that are commonly used in optomechanics and the predictions that you would get if you just did the hardcore photon counting yourself. Uh, there's some disparities between these two predictions, and they've led to confusion in our collaboration for a number of years. So I'm going to point out uh, things that we can learn from those, uh, hopefully in a pedagogical way. And then just some uh, words about uh, analog RQI implementations other than the under effect. Uh, entanglement harvesting, maybe this area, area law confirmations. Um, these uh, are collectively known uh, as by the acronym ANARCHY. Um, so just a, a couple of words about the experimental setup uh, for this under effect uh, in circular motion experiment. The basic idea is that in order to not destroy this uh, pancake, we want to set up uh, a laser that has uh, equal contributions on both sides of an atomic resonance in our sample so that we don't destroy it. So it's basically just going to balance the Stark potentials that are, that are acting on this system. And to do that, we put a single peak laser into a modulator, filter out the central peak, and then we have this two-peaked modulated uh, laser that we shoot and deflect along a circular uh, trajectory so that it traces out a point of interaction along a circle uh, in our pancake. Uh, this is our PRL about that idea for the BEC. And then we uh, showed that it could also be done uh, in superfluid helium. And that's currently being implemented uh, as we speak in Silica's Gravity Laboratory. Um, a couple of just quick things about the photon counting. Uh, the two things we know about what's going to happen when we send this modulated laser into our photo detector. Um, well, it's going to have uh, an expected photocurrent that's going to be related to this uh, combination of electric field amplitudes that are entering it. And here, uh, these plus and minus superscripts just refer to the positive and negative components of that electric field that's entering the photocurrent. Um, the most important one for the under effect, because we want to be Observing some signature of correlations that are sampled along this accelerated trajectory uh, in this effective 2 plus 1 relativistic field that get inserted into our laser field. We want to pull those out. So the unequal time correlator of that photo detection is really going to be the most important thing that we're going to look to to see that signature. Uh, unfortunately, the simplest way you do it, you throw that in and you find that it to leading order gives you 
the exact wrong thing that you would like. You, you want the piece of this, what's called a Whiteman function, as uh, the previous talks may have already indicated. You want the part of this that in 2 plus 1 uh, is imaginary. The straightforward calculation shows that you get, in that first leading order unequal time correlation, you get just the real part. This is a problem uh, that has to be solved by either post-processing, uh, spatial interferometry, or some other techniques. Um, and I'll give one example of one thing that you could do to overcome that. Um, generally, we just have this photon flux that's entering our photo detectors. It's carrying a signal. We have some modulation at this uh, capital omega uh, frequency. And uh, some electromagnetic quadratures that are sitting around. This one is related to common mode, and this one is a difference mode signal. Um, this bit carries fluctuations from the pancake uh, that we're going to use as a signature of our under effect. Now, if we split this up into something that looks just like shot noise and something that's a signal plus some back action, then uh, we can represent in our analysis of that operator, the photon flux operator, uh, nice decompositions into pieces that we care about, pieces that we're trying to reduce, and uh, pieces that just come along for the ride. So in optomechanics, they generally care about taking this photon flux operator and just assuming that it's the operator that we get to measure. If I measure it, I get some distribution of, of uh, experimental outcomes, and from that, I can find all of the moments of this operator and just forget about the photo detection process altogether and only think about a single operator, its power spectrum, its moments, and, and so on. The problem with this, uh, although you can get a long way into understanding the experiment, the problem with it is that it expect, or it predicts that you get this response function popping out at the beat, around the beat frequency of this power spectrum for my photon flux operator. Now, we already know that that can't happen because the part that's non-zero of the Whiteman function, which when you Fourier transform to get the power spectrum, would give you this, that part vanishes. So there's an immediate disparity between the optomechanics prediction and the main quantity that they focus on and the predictions of Glauber, which we know uh, are the most accurate representation of what photo detection uh, is modeled in. So this uh, led to a problem um, that we're still resolving, or really still straightening out. Um, it confused us for a while, but well, there, there are ways around this. So what can we do? One of the things we could do is uh, autocorrelate the output signal. Instead of trying to extract everything just from the photo detected uh, signal carrying laser that comes out of our sample, well, we can take the fact that Glauber predicts these unequal time correlations vanish for the thing that we want, take that piece of information, and just work with it. Say, OK, well, I'll set up my own unequal time correlations by autocorrelating the signal. And then the Glauber probability for just the expected photocurrents coming out of each of these two output arms of the autocorrelator they have unequal time correlations that give you the exact correct imaginary component of that Whiteman function. So this is one possibility. Um, this delay line would have to be a fiber optic uh, line that looped a tremendous number of times to achieve the correct uh, uh, time lapse for this. So this is just a more a conceptual uh, suggestion than anything else. But it gets the point across that Really, all we need to do is transform in a particular way using either spatial interferometry or other methods. And we can get different information that's in our signal manifest in those experimental signatures. OK, now that the, the details of that uh, UNRU experiment have been discussed, what else can we do with these kinds of detectors? One of the things you might imagine is just, well, what happens if we take two of them? Shoot them at this pancake. Uh, in particular ways. The simplest one, just being non-accelerating paths, static points of intersection. Um, can we use this to probe other features of that effective quantum field? 
the implementation described here is in, for entanglement harvesting. Um, and so the idea is I want to use my two uh, continuous laser field detectors uh, as detectors for that relativistic field and harvest entanglement that's in that field, um, either at very, very low temperatures so that I could consider it an effective vacuum, or potentially at higher temperatures um, where you have to battle a little bit of thermal noise and uh, there are thresholds uh, with the, that describe whether you can actually extract entanglement from those or not. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated, but for now just assume that I have a cold enough temperature that this is a vacuum, and I'm going to use these two lasers to steal entanglement from that field. Um, just like in the other uh, the experimental setup, uh, these two beams are going to be prepared to have these dual peaks so that I don't destroy my pancake in the process. In superfluid helium, this is not quite as necessary. Um, you have uh, no atomic resonances that are really in the vicinity of these laser frequencies that we want to use, uh, so uh, we can ignore that for that purpose. Um, but for BECs, it's, it's a very helpful uh, technique uh, to minimize disturbance of the pancake. Um, anyway, this is just a, a descriptions of how that beam preparation goes. Uh, the basic idea comes from the RQI community. Uh, lots of people in the room know a lot about this from over the years. Yeah. And uh, it's just like the model that we've seen before uh, for the Unruh DeWitt detector, but uh, we have a little bit extra structure. So we have a sum over J equals A and B for the two detectors, and now we have smearing over space, uh, as well as the switching over time and the regular monopole moment uh, that just uh, has these two levels here depicted with an energy gap uh, represented by capital omega. Um, this uh, smearing function basically just describes the spot size of the laser, and it limits the modes that your detector is sensitive to in the, in the BEC or superfluid, uh, superfluid helium sample, and um, just does so in a self-consistent way. Um, the causality issues that you usually get for extended rigid objects don't really apply here because the speed of propagation in your sample is so much slower than the, for the laser uh, that they don't really come into play. But you still have to be careful about them. Um, and so you could calculate RQI uh, interested or uh, quantities that the RQI community uh, care about, like the negativity. Um, this is just a generalization of the standard uh, pair of under DeWitt detector calculation, um, except I've uh, included uh, dispersion, because in any analog gravity experiment, you have a dispersive, uh, a dispersive system that, that we're probing. So the field itself has dispersion, and we need to keep track of whether we're in the right regime so that we're probing the linear part of the dispersion relation so that it looks like an effective vacuum field, for instance. Um, and these uh, analyses, they, they tell you a couple of things about where you need to look in the parameter space to find this. Um, they tell you, for instance, you get a maximal harvest of entanglement for times that are rather short compared to the energy gaps uh, and the frequencies of the modes that you're probing, uh, <coughs> sub-cycle, uh, which is surprising to me, but not really when you think about it. Um, the details uh, are, of course, well known in the community. Um, but they actually do make it perfect for an implementation with these uh, continuous laser fields if you use pulses. So instead of the continuous beams uh, that have mostly monochromatic structure, uh, this implementation requires pulses. So uh, if you do the analysis of the experimental uh, version of this with lasers, you find that you get effectively the same uh, reduced density matrix structure. Uh, if you neglect uh, double excitations of individual detectors, but that doesn't actually contribute to the negativity to leading order. So effectively, they have the same type of structure. And this is a nice implementation uh, to represent those simple cases of two under DeWitt detectors. Um, in terms of experimentation, this is the last thing I'm going to say about harvesting. Um, it's a little bit more sensible to 
base your entanglement condition on something called the inseparability. Uh, there isn't really a finite time version of it to correspond to these pulses, but uh, we're working to establish the validity and applicability of a finite time version. Uh, basically, the idea is to measure variances of output quadratures of these two lasers and use that, uh, because it's so much more accessible experimentally, to characterize whether you've stolen entanglement and how much entanglement you've stolen. Um, and just uh, in closing, there are a couple of last uh, things I want to say about upcoming experiments. There's a really cool paper that Silco told us about that our uh, collaborator in Vienna um, came out with very recently, Jörg Schmidtmeier, um, verifying the area law using quantum simulators. And this is just another example of really cool information theoretic uh, simulations that these cold atom systems open us up to. Um, and a couple of just really cool things about this work. Um, it's a one-dimensional uh, quantum field that's being simulated, but you see this nice uh, linear relationship between the von Neumann entropy uh, associated with partitioning this thing and um, the, the length of the partition. So this is a, this is a entropy, this is a volume entropy law um, that you would expect for thermal states. And the more, uh, more significant one is the area law. Now, in one dimension, the area is a point, and you may say, okay, this is a constant, and that point has a constant area. What have you really shown? But it could have been anything else. <laughs> you, they, did, they did show that it, it was a constant, and that point is a constant uh, area, and okay, area law. <laughs> um, now the question is, can we do this for a pancake? Can we explore, uh, expand that idea to something that is potentially more rich in structure than, uh, than the, the constant area? Um, in the vacuum, for a flat space-time, maybe this would be interesting. Ultimately, for a vortex flow representing a curved space-time, there are lots of possibilities with this. And the techniques that, that Jorg and his collaborators uh, have been coming up with uh, could be really invaluable for those applications as well. And uh, at that, I will say uh, thank you for listening and acknowledge most of the people that have helped me in my life. Um, that I'm very grateful for. Thank you, Cisco, for the talk, connecting um, all the theory that we're doing along with the experiments and um, with a future outlook for further experiments. Um, are there any uh, questions in the room about anything Cisco um, has talked about today? Other than the point area thing. <laughs> we, need, we need Jorg to to defend that one. <laughs> or when uh, in, in we think about the future prospects evolving from a point law to a, a line law, I guess, in the, uh, the pancake case. Are there any uh, online uh, questions? Then I would like to thank Cisco for your Wonderful. time today. And uh, can we all give... Thank you.